Thank you, worship team. And good morning, everybody. Uh, if we haven't met yet, my name's Kathy Haug. And so, so glad to be back in the auditorium. Honestly, I've missed most of June traveling. And so I've been catching up on where you've all been in the Psalms and listened to some great messages from John and Phil and Amy. And I love the ways that they were using music because we're in songs, right? So uh, if you have been here, we had a little, oh brother, where art thou a couple weeks ago? And then Amy brought some 80s hip hop. Come on, it takes two. I was like, Amy. I had to look up who actually did that song. Rob Bass and DJ Easy Rock. Did anybody know that? I don't know if it's a one hit wonder, but I was like, I think we need more 80s hip hop. So Mike, you're on it. <laughs> on it, okay. <laughs> Uh, but actually, the last couple of weeks, um, our whole family had just the great honor and privilege to spend a couple of weeks in country in Costa Rica. And we were joining a team of students and staff as part of InterVarsity's global program. So I work with College Campus Ministry University Christian Fellowship. So we were joining a team on this global program. And we had a great time partnering with the local student movement. Um, they call it ECU, um, which is Estudiantes Cristianos Unidos, but we call them ECU. And we were um, in country to help revitalize their campus ministry after the pandemic. The campuses were just opening up for the first time. Um, and they're about to go on what's their winter break, even though it was still quite hot, but winter break. And so we got to get on campus with these students, uh, meet new people, encourage the local movement. We even got to work with um, the public university faculty and students in some other English language learning classes and just had a great time. Um, and I'm kind of curious for if maybe someone's been to Costa Rica or knows a little bit about Tico culture. So Costa Ricans call themselves Ticos. Does anybody know the kind of Spanish expression that Costa Ricans are famous for. Can anyone shout it out? Anyone know? Anyone know? They're here? Kids, what is it? Pura Vida. Pura Vida. Pura Vida. Can you say Pura Vida? Pura Vida. One more time. Pura Vida. Pura Vida. Pura Vida. Pura Vida. Pura Vida. All right. So Pura Vida. Now you know. So that's kind of their Costa Rican um, phrase. And Pura Vida means pure life. And the expression is, um, you know, it's the good life, the pure life. It's really more about kind of an attitude. Um, they would say a vibe, a way of being. It's about a laid back, carefree, kind of optimistic way to look at life. Pura vida. And what's interesting is there is a ton of life. You can kind of see this is our fam waiting to catch a bus. We rode a lot of buses around the country. Um, and there is a lot of life and joy among the Costa Rican people. Um, in particular, I have this great memory from our trip. One day, it was a Tuesday. We were about to go on campus to do some outreach. And we remembered that that day, the Costa Rican national football or soccer team was playing against New Zealand for a spot in the World Cup. I don't know if there's any soccer fans out there. Okay, so the whole country shut down. Like people didn't go to work and we were like, what are we gonna do on campus? Well, the university actually canceled classes and streamed the game in the auditorium. So we totally just joined them for the game and it was an amazing game. Like they were the underdogs, but they scored in the first three minutes a goal, and then the rest of the game was like a nail biter. It was like New Zealand scored, and then it got reversed on review, and then there was a red card, and the whole like student group was chanting, Rojo, Rojo, which means red. Um, and they won. And so here's a picture of like the reaction. The room just went bonkers. It was amazing. If you have never watched a soccer game with true national fans, I mean, it's amazing. Do it if you can ever do it. It was awesome. So there's a ton of joy and life among the Costa Rican people. But just like a lot of the rest of the world, it's been a really difficult time for the country. Um, when we first got there, some things we learned right away. Um, the currency, the colones, has lost a lot of value. Their economy is really struggling. Um, our kind of first driver was telling us that just recently there had been major hacks into the government and the banking systems of the country. Um, and that's impacting life across all sectors. We met a student actually whose brother had been waiting three years for a surgery. And because of the hack into the government systems, 
all the health records were lost. Like his health records are gone and he may never get this surgery. Um, there's just a lot of challenges. And I remember um, there was a day where um, the students on our team had met some other students in San Jose on some campuses there. And um, one of the students they met, Leandro, they learned he was actually not doing well in his classes and he was on the brink of failing one of his English classes. But the professor said that if he spent a certain amount of time with our American students, native speakers, working on his English, that she would pass him. And so um, there were a series of connections. And one night, our student, our US student Calvin, was talking to Leandro and just hearing about his life and his family story. And at one point in the conversation, when he was talking about how difficult it had been, Leandro said, I guess Pura Vida is just for the tourists. And Calvin came and shared this with the rest of the team. And he just said, it's just so sad. And it was. And, and I watched this you know, university student trying to hold the sadness of this, you know, new friend he just made, right? And he didn't quite know how to hold it, you could tell. He didn't know what to do with it. But then Calvin said, I don't know, maybe, maybe we should pray about it or something. And it was a really sweet moment, actually. I love that response. He, he felt uncomfortable, he didn't know what to do. But I love that his instinct was, maybe we should just take it to God. And it's that instinct, right? that we see in the very psalms that we're looking at in this series. Because the psalms teach us, they show us how to take the strongest of our emotions, the questions and doubts, all those things, to God. And the past few weeks, the themes that have been unpacked have been around honesty, community, and prayer. And for the next three, we're going to consider how the Psalms give voice to these strong and deep emotions of the human experience. And in particular, sadness, anger, and joy. And maybe you picked up one of those bookmarks and you're following along. Maybe you're listening to the Psalms and the podcasts for each day and week. But that's where we're going. And today we're focusing on a Psalm of Sadness. And, you know, it's interesting, I think we've all learned some things either directly or maybe indirectly in our families of origin, our experiences about how to handle our stronger emotions, right? Maybe you've learned they're good, bad, neutral. Perhaps you've learned some things consciously or unconsciously about when it's appropriate to feel those things or express them to yourself, to others, to God. And so I want you to think just for a second about your family experience, right? Maybe you're um, a child or a teenager now or a college student. You're still kind of at your home, in your home space. Maybe you're grown and your family of origin feels like a long time ago. But I want you to think to some of your formative experiences and think about sadness in particular. How did your family express, or not, sadness? in your home when you were growing up. So think for a second, how did your family express that? And then I want you to turn to a neighbor or a couple people and just share an insight or two. And try to, if someone's beside you who does, isn't with someone else, try to include them and just share for just a moment. How did your family express sadness when you were growing up? Okay, go ahead and talk for just a minute or two in small groups. Well, in my household uh, as a child, it was interesting because my parents were really kind of at the opposite ends of the emoting spectrum. Um, so my mother was a very strong feeler and every emotion was big and out there and plain to see. And in some ways, um, she really set the kind of emotional temperature of our household. She was the thermostat, so she set the climate and the temperature. Um, and my dad, on the other hand, was... Um, extremely reserved and fairly passive, non-emotive. So he would kind of suppress everything and maybe very occasionally blow up. And usually it was anger that came out. But so I had these kind of two extremes. And as a child, I think I thought back later and realized that actually created a lot of confusion in me 
and some shame about like the emotions I was feeling and not knowing what was like a healthy way to express them or should I feel them or not. And I remember when I started to follow Jesus in college and I first kind of rediscovered the Psalms, I remember thinking I had found this voice that could be my voice for a lot of these feelings. And I also felt like I'd found this companionship as a strong feeler with big emotions, but that I wanted to bring in a healthy way out to the world. And I started doing some learning about Psalms, and I love some things that an author named Terry Smith wrote about particularly these songs of sadness or lament, and what they do for us as a people who are seeking after God. So the Psalms of lament do a lot of things. First, they provide a language for pain, so that the reality of the loss and the pain from that loss can finally be addressed. The Psalms of Lament validate and normalize the sadness and hurt, the doubts, the confusion that accompany the grief process. The Lament Psalms reduce the sense of isolation that grievers can feel as they realize they're actually in concert with a long line generations of fellow sufferers. They invite us to listen to the anguish of one another without judgment or censure. And they give voice, a voice of hope in the midst of despair. And we're going to look at an example of one of those psalms today. It's actually two, Psalms 42 and 43. In some of the earliest Hebrew manuscripts, it's actually one piece, and so we're going to hold them together. And if you'd like to pull out your Bible now or pull up the Bible app on your phone, we're going to kind of work through this text together and see what we can learn, what we can, how we can have the voice, right, a voice for the lament and sadness. And it, it's such an interesting um, set of psalms because if you look at it, the first thing you'll see um, is a kind of a subtext. And it says, for the director of music, a maskil of the sons of Korah. And a maskil, we, we don't know exactly what that is. It's probably some kind of literary or musical term to inform how the song is meant to be uh, participated in in community. But the inscription about the sons of Korah is really interesting because um, we often think, and, and many of the psalms are attributed to King David, but this is one of 11 that are actually attributed to the sons of Korah. And a brief kind of background on that, it's fascinating. If you look at numbers... Um, number 16 is where the story about the, of Korah and his descendants begins. And so we actually learn that um, at this time, the duties of kind of the worship life had been divvied up between a few of the tribes and people groups. And um, Korah was the son uh, of one of the leaders who was leading in a particular part of, of temple worship life, in particular kind of carrying and holding, carrying for some of the, the artifacts of worship um, in the tabernacle. And for some reason, they had just become increasingly discontent and envious about the roles of the other worship leaders, right? Wanting to do their job, thinking it was more glamorous or, or more favored or important. And so Korah actually gathered a about 250 other folks and rose up in rebellion against Moses and his leadership. And as you can imagine, it does not go well for them. Uh, in fact, the, the story goes, the earth opens up and they're swallowed up, the whole rebellion. But in Numbers 26, it actually, there's a genealogy. And what we learn is that God spared some of the descendants of Korah, the sons of Korah. And this text in that little inscription tells us that centuries later, they're actually still participating in the life of worship of the people of God. They've had a redemptive experience, and now we have their songs captured for us. And so that's what we want to know in terms of context. And as we look at this song, this is a song that is about sadness, but it's particularly about a spiritual sadness, about a soul sadness. And so I want you to listen as we go through it for the elements of lament, which you'll find really consistently across all the different lament psalms. So I want you to listen. There's three kind of elements. First, there's a complaint. And you're going to hear this, this complaint or this cry for help and the description of the distress they're in. That's the first. And secondly, you will hear a petition. There's an appeal to God 
and reasons that they believe divine intervention is necessary and must come. And lastly, we'll hear a resolution. That's the third part of a lament psalm. There's this note of certainty or resolve, right? That the prayer has been heard. Often there's a vow or a praise of God made for the deliverance that they're expectant for. So complaint, petition, and resolution. So if you're following along, you can read with me Psalm 42, or just listen to the words. It starts with a really beautiful image. The psalmist writes, As the deer panteth for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? My tears have been my food day and night while people say to me all day long, where's your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I used to go to the house of God under the protection of the Mighty One with shouts of joy and praise among the festive throng. So pause there, right? We see the beginnings of the complaint, right? And the imagery is one of a deep, and profound spiritual thirst. And the writers intentionally, they don't say hunger, they say thirst, because think about it. Hunger uh, it can, is a significant and deep, um, distressful experience, but thirst is even more desperate, isn't it? You can go a lot longer without food than you can without water. And so we have that sense of the desperation, right? as they bring this petition. And there's all of these images around water in this text, right? We've already seen the streams and the tears. And the second part of that, that complaint, right, is, is the, this kind of taunting, day in, day out, where is your God? And this is not kind of, uh, your God isn't real. Atheism is, is, is a pretty modern construct, but this is, your God has abandoned you. He's not showing up to hear and respond to your cry, where is that God? And so the writer is feeling far from God. They're probably literally far from the temple and the life of community worship that they love and know. It's likely that these sons of Korah actually are maybe fleeing with David and the entourage, right? And they're literally not in Jerusalem, this place that is dear to them of worship. It continues in verse five, why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. My soul is downcast within me, therefore I will remember you from the land of the Jordan, the heights of Hermon, from Mount Mizar, deep calls to deep in the roar of your waterfalls. All your waves and breakers have swept over me. I, I love this part of the psalm because, and, and this doesn't happen in every psalm, but we'll see it, that as the complaint is rising up, the writer actually turns and starts to have this dialogue with their own soul, right? They ask this question, why soul, right? Why are you so downcast, so disturbed, and then it's like they exhort their soul, like, put your hope in God, soul. Put your hope in God. I will yet praise him. Right? And that part is actually going to become the chorus that's repeated throughout this text. And that language, you know, sadness is so much actually about a sense of loss or a felt lack. And the image of being downcast is it's quite literal like cast down right it's destroyed we'd say it's we're wrecked we are cast down but it's so interesting because look at verse six right my soul is downcast within me therefore that connecting word right therefore what will the writer do it says i will remember you 
isn't this such an interesting connective word, right? That it's, they're so downcast and therefore the response is remembrance. I don't know how you handle and carry your sadness and sorrow, but I think it is a common human experience in our sadness actually to distance ourselves from God and others. We just don't want to go there. We don't want that pain to well up in us. Maybe for me, for example, I feel deep resentments in my sorrow. And I try to like punish other people by holding them at arm's length. And I think it's so interesting that they saw that out of the depth of their despair, the appropriate response was actually to remember God, to go to God. And even though they're far away, it says literally they're across the Jordan. They are far from Jerusalem, right? Even though they're in places like Mount Hermon, which was known as the place Moses met with God, they still feel so far, but they will remember. They'll remember all the times that God was near, though they feel so far. And then there's that imagery. Did you see, did you catch that additional water imagery, right? We had the waterfall, We had the waterfall, we had the waves and the breakers. So more of that rich water imagery. And I'm, how many of you have ever been to like a pretty significant, like a large waterfall, seen one in person? Raise your hand, maybe some national parks, right? We've been, many of you have seen a waterfall. We uh, had the opportunity to see the Nuyaka Falls when we were in Costa Rica. And I have just a short video clip um, of that. And I want you to just watch the falls and I want you to hear the sounds of the water as a way to kind of fill out the senses that the writer is trying to kind of evoke and awaken with this imagery. Ben, as many of you have, at a waterfall, or maybe you've stood, as we did on the shores of the Pacific, right, where the waves were breaking, you can kind of remember, I could feel the base actually, like I could feel it a little bit. And that's how it is when you're there, like you actually feel it, and the sound is almost deafening sometimes. And so the writer uses this image, and it says, deep calls to deep. And I want to I want us to kind of understand what's going on there. If you get into that space, right, imagine that waterfall, the water's pouring down, like it's relentlessly coming down and slamming on the rocks. Or at the, you know, the ocean waves, they just keep coming and coming. And the writer's getting in touch with this feeling of sorrow that feels overwhelming. It just doesn't stop. It just keeps coming and I feel overwhelmed. Sometimes sorrow can feel like we will drown in the midst of it, like we can't catch our breath. And that's the type of pain that the writer's getting in touch with. And yet at the same time, the writer is remembering God and the depths of God's love and power and comfort and mercies. And surely the depths of God are equal to the depth of our sorrows. And deep calls to deep. And in that connection of our deep sufferings, we can call out to the deep love of God. In verse 8, the complaint continues, but there is a bit of hope. Verse 8 says, By day the Lord directs his love. At night his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. Still the wrestling. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why must I go about mourning, oppressed by the enemy? My bones suffer mortal agony as my foes taunt me, saying to me all day long, where is your God? Why, my soul, are you downcast? 
Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. So it's interesting how even in the acknowledgement of who God is, the honesty of the human soul in suffering is that it continues to wrestle, right? We're fighting to remember the day by day and night by night mercies and care of God, right? The psalmist says, this is who you are, God. You're my song. You're my rock. You're my savior. But this is who I am. I feel forgotten. I'm mourning, I'm taunted, I'm overwhelmed. Back to the soul dialogue. Why soul, right? Why? Do you do this? I do this. I talk to myself a lot, actually. I talk to my mind and heart and soul. Why? Why are you like this, right? Why soul? Are you so disturbed? Right, we hear that chorus again. And finally, the petition comes in 43. As the psalmist writes this, vindicate me. Oh God, this is verse 1 of 43. Plead my cause against an unfaithful nation. Rescue me from those who are deceitful and wicked. You're my God, my stronghold. Why have you rejected me? Why must I go about mourning, oppressed by the enemy? Send me your light and your faithful care. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy mountain, to the place where you dwell. And finally, the praise, the resolution breaks through as the writer says, then I will go to the altar of God. To God, my joy and my delight, I will praise you with a lyre, oh God, my God. And a final chorus, why my soul are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my savior and my God. Did you know there's uh, over 60 psalms that have significant sections of lament in them? That's, of 150, that's a significant number. Right. And there are both personal um, and communal lament psalms. And what makes these not just sad songs, but songs of lament, is that the people take their pain to God and they are not without hope. They come with a cry against something that's wrong. It is. It's not as it should be. In their bodies, in their families, in their loved ones, in the world, they come with a cry and a complaint, but they believe that God cares and will do something about it. And that is the invitation as we find our own voice in the Psalms too. Because the Psalms, they're going to challenge perhaps our inability. Maybe we didn't have good ways of expressing our strong emotions. Maybe um, they were considered negative, right? We were meant and trained consciously or unconsciously to hold and suppress them. But these psalms of lament challenge our inability to acknowledge those intense emotions that come with grief. And they, they can really free us to make a bold expression of sorrow and sadness to God and in our community. And lastly, I think the songs and psalms of lament, they allow us actually to rely on God and the community to carry hope on our behalf when maybe we ourselves do not have hope. One of the things you'll see, as I, I said, is so many of these psalms actually have this shape or a structure to them. So they also actually become, they teach us how to voice these things. I mean, they give us a guide and a structure for grief itself. And as Mike had mentioned, one of the invitations through this whole series is that we would actually write our own songs and psalms. They might be of, about community. They might be just our honest daily experience. They might be songs of anger or joy, or in this case, sadness. And so I want to give us just a few minutes to help you begin to think about how you might write a song 
of sadness. And so to do that, as you came in, there are some cards and pens in the back. If you grabbed one or have a journal and paper, that's great. Otherwise, I'm going to ask um, Preston, and maybe can I have Chris and Porter go help? I mean, if you need a card or a pen, kind of raise your hand and they'll bring one to you. Love for everybody to have something to write with and write on um, as we're trying to apply our learning from the psalm. And while they're coming around, indicate, you know, give them a little wave if you need something. I want you to start thinking, what is something that you're sad about? Okay, what's something that you're carrying sadness about? This might come very quickly to mind because it might be very close. It might be very acute and fresh. Could be a, a, a death of a loved one. A diagnosis in your family. It could be a, a loss of a work or livelihood. It could be something that actually feels a little more distant. I know when, when we came back from Costa Rica, I turned off, we were kind of unplugged. I turned off a lot of my apps and I, as I turned the news back on and just scrolled, there's a lot to be sad about in the world, right? Uh, but I don't, what are you holding? Just try to be honest. What's one place of sadness that you're holding? And as the cards and pens come around, we're not going to write our psalm, but I want to give you some prompts to think about what elements could come out. And this uses the very shape of Psalm 42 that we were just in. So just on your index card, write a few words or phrase to finish each of these prompts. Okay, the first prompt is, I long for you too. So what do you long for God to do with this, in this place of sorrow or sadness that you hold? Just write a few words or phrase about your longing. What do you long for God to do? And then out of that longing, just name even the sadness in your soul. My soul is cast down because, name in a word or phrase or sentence, what that sadness is. What is kind of casting down, wrecking your soul right now. The third prompt is about how we feel forgotten, right? This is um, hearkening to that idea of where is your God? So try to complete the sentence. I feel forgotten by God when. How would you finish that sentence? The fourth thing we saw in this was about that kind of pressure they were feeling from outside, right? So think, I feel oppressed by my enemies, whatever those enemies or pressures might be, when, dot, dot, dot. What makes you feel trapped, oppressed, threatened in this place of sadness? And then just as the psalmist turns with resolve, right, and remembers who God is, the last prompt is, I will again hope in God. God is my. Put a few words or images to describe who God is in the midst of your sadness. How will you remember the very nature of God to be sustained? So leave these prompts on the screen for a few moments. You may continue to reflect and write on your psalm. Um, 
I invite you as we begin to worship, um, you can turn to worship, right? Just as the psalmist does, right? We turn and actually it's a way to express our soul thirst for God. And maybe you're not actually feeling very thirsty or don't recognize it, but you can even ask God, like, make a holy thirst in me for you, right? So worship team, if you um, would come up as we continue to write, and as you write or worship and express your sorrows and sadness to God, the God who can hold them, the God who can handle them, just be reminded that there are also ways we can companion with each other. So one of those ways is prayer. And if you need someone to just pray for you and hold that sadness with you, you can come and receive some prayer ministry during worship. And if you want to just remember in a more visceral way that Jesus, the man of sorrows, holds it with you, you can come and receive communion. So continue to be in this space with the Lord.